Hi, my name is Matt Walker. I am a professor of neuroscience at the University of California, Berkeley, and I am the author of the book, Why We Sleep, and I'm about to bust some sleep myths for you. Does counting sheep actually help you fall asleep? Well, it's a long-standing belief, uh, and you've probably been told it. Unfortunately, it's a myth that I have to bust because those studies have been done very well, carefully controlled studies. And what they found is that when you instruct people to count sheep to try and help them fall asleep, um, they don't sleep uh, any quicker, they don't fall asleep any faster. If anything, in fact, it took them longer to fall asleep relative to perhaps just not doing anything at all. One of the interesting things though, one of the control conditions in that study is that they asked them just to think about a nice walk that you would typically go on, maybe a walk into the woods or a walk down towards the beach. And what they found was that that was something that did hasten the onset of sleep. So if you want to do something with your mind, to try and improve the speed with which you fall asleep. Maybe just taking yourself on that mental navigational journey on one of those nice walks. Also, meditation is something that's incredibly powerful to help you fall asleep faster as well, but certainly counting sheep is not one of those things. There is one notion that eating cheese can actually disrupt your sleep, or some people have described it even giving them nightmares. Um, there haven't really been any particular good studies right now that have been done on this. There's nothing necessarily in cheese that we know of that is strongly linked to an increase in things like nightmare frequency uh, or dream frequency necessarily. So right now it seems to be a myth, but there is no good data supporting either side of that argument. Do ocean noises or white noise uh, help you sleep? Certainly it seems to be one of those things that people enjoy if they get a selection of things that they can choose on a sound machine or on their phone to try and help them sleep, they pick those things. We don't actually have any scientific data yet regarding the, the benefit or the efficacy of those things. Um, if they do, and I think the fact that a lot of people do try to use them and find them helpful, it's probably due to the rhythmic nature. Sleep, at least your deep sleep, is all about a rhythmic brainwave oscillation. And in fact, some studies have looked at during deep sleep, if you start to play just tones at the same sort of frequency of your brainwaves going up and down, you can actually try to amplify and you can actually increase the size of those deep sleep waves. Those tones have to be below the level of perception though. They can't be tones that are waking you up. So it could be that this sort of slow rhythmic brain activity that starts to happen as we fall asleep may actually be encouraged by these types of sounds. Almost think of it like a metronome for the sleeping brain that as you're sort of starting to gift it with that rhythm, it actually helps the brain get more into set. But right now the data uh, is not quite there to make the recommendation. Are naps a good thing? Should we all be napping? Um, the answer here is yes and no. And I'll explain a little bit. Firstly, what we've demonstrated at my sleep center is that naps actually can give benefits. They can give benefits for things like learning and memory. They can increase, uh, give a boost to the immune system. They can calm down and quiet the cardiovascular system. So naps certainly can be beneficial. The only downside with naps, however, is that they can actually prevent you from having good sleep at night. So from the moment that you woke up this morning, a chemical has been building up in your brain, and that chemical is called adenosine. Now, the more of that chemical that builds up, the sleepier that you feel. And after about 16 hours of accumulation of that sleepiness chemical, you should feel tired enough to fall asleep and tired enough to stay asleep. And then it's during sleep at night that we actually clear away that sleepiness chemical, almost like a, a pressure uh, valve cooker where we sort of release that sleepiness steam and we wake up feeling refreshed. And this is one of the dangers with naps. If you take a nap in the day, especially if it's too long or if it's too late in the day, you're going to release some of that healthy sleepy pressure that you've been building up and you may find it more difficult to fall asleep or stay asleep at night. So the advice is that if you can nap regularly and you don't have problems falling asleep, then naps are probably just fine. But if you can't nap regularly and build that into your routine, 
And especially if you're someone who struggles with sleep at night, the advice is don't nap during the day, stay awake, build up lots of that healthy sleep pressure, and you'll give yourself the best chance to fall asleep and stay asleep at night. Can you actually split your sleep schedule? Maybe could you take four hours at night and four hours in the day? Um, firstly, that ratio split of a half-half split night and day um, does not seem to be the way that we're designed, nor does it, if you implement it, produce the best health uh, and wellness outcome benefits. But it does actually pose a very interesting question. How are we as a species, human beings, designed to sleep? Because right now in first world nations, most of us sleep in what we call a, a monophasic pattern, which is one long bout of sleep at night. What's interesting, however, is that if you look at cultures that have not been touched by electricity, they don't sleep the way that we do. They sleep in what we call a biphasic pattern, and they get about six and a half, seven hours of sleep at night, and then they will often have this siesta-like nap in the afternoon. And in fact, if you actually measure someone's brainwave activity throughout the day, right around that sort of post-lunch time period when, you know, if you're around the meeting table at work, you'll start to see, you know, a lot of you know, these things going on, these heads not. It's not people listening to good music, it's actually that they're giving way to what we've identified, which is a genetically hardwired pre-programmed drop in your alertness right in the afternoon period. Some people think it has to do with having a big lunch. That's not true. You can actually have people not eat and they still have that drop in their alertness. And it goes back to that hunter-gatherer tribe data. Perhaps we as a species were not designed to be sleeping in this long single bout. Perhaps we were designed to be sleeping biphasically rather than monophasically.